Thank you very much. H have we had enough? Have we had enough of conflict? Have we had enough of uh, controversy? Have we had enough of pollsters and pundits who talk but don't say anything? Uh, have we had enough? Well, we've had enough, uh, but the sorry truth of the matter is that uh, the bad news is that we're going to continue to have this controversy going forward as the Pew Research Center has outlined. Uh, the political parties are dividing and that division is continuing and this is a very serious challenge for us in our democracy and today I want to talk a little bit about what we're going to do about it, what we have been doing about it and how Rockford can play a role in this. This is a map of where I've been over the last three years. Uh, I'm a child of the Cleveland area, a child of steel, a child of manufacturing. I grew up knowing that something fundamental was happening in our economy. Something very fundamental was wrong in our economy and we had to figure out some new ways to address these challenges. So I prepared myself professionally and I started my journey uh, to a new place in Washington DC. Uh, after professionally training at uh, a business and law school, I decided to go to Washington and see if I could come up with some new solutions. So I started out and worked my way up and by 1983 I was uh, on the Senate Democratic Policy Committee. Uh, sadly though, I only stayed seven months. I gave up. And the reason I gave up was because both political parties were in an ideological war. Uh, on the one hand, we had the Democrats saying that the challenge could be only met by going backwards to the uh, New Deal. They wanted big government. And on the other hand, we had the Republicans saying essentially, no, the problem is the government and what we need to do is dismantle it. So you had a choice of between big government and no government. And this was no choice at all. So I decided to learn more deeply about what was really going on and I joined a corporate strategy consulting firm. And about a year later, I was sitting at the dock uh, at the um, Mazda complex in Hiroshima. And I had been part of a uh, consulting firm that was one of the first to really explore the differences between the Japanese and, auto, and uh, automobile manufacturing process and the American automobile manufacturing process. And about that X point, I decided, wow, we're in a heap of trouble. The Japanese have figured out how to manufacture a car with a completely different business model. Our business model was hierarchical, very stable. Uh, their business model was fat, flat and networked. And so I started to understand the value and the power of networks. Now, fast forward about five, six, seven years and I'm in Xi'an, China. Now let me set the stage for where, where I was. I was in an old factory. I was representing an optical company trying to find a distributor for their products in China. The old factory had peeling walls. It was in the middle of winter. It was cold. There was uh, big, huge rubber mats over the doorways. And I walked around the corner and there sat the uh, most advanced lens polishing equipment that the Swiss made. Their polishing equipment was far better than anything we had. And I realized that the networks the Chinese had gave them access to the technologies and that we were not looking at a distributor, we were looking at a competitor. We were looking at a company that could really blow us away. So part of the challenge was understanding the nature of the Chinese uh, uh, networks and how they were building their competitive strength. Let me take you to Singapore, which is what happened about two years after that. I was sitting in a meeting with my brother's internet company and talking to his chief technology officer, who was a physicist and he was explaining the World Wide Web. Who better but a physicist to explain the World Wide Web? They invented it. Uh, and Jonathan was telling me, the World Wide Web is going to be a completely different type of medium. It's our first interactive mass medium. It's going to change the way in which we do business. And you need to understand this in the line of work you're in. And so he told me about open source software development and he said study these models, understand how complex projects can be done in an open network with loosely connect, loose connections. How does that actually happen? Well, I took these lessons to Oklahoma City. I was in the, uh, in 1993, I was in the, the first floor of this parking garage with about six or seven other people. And this is where the Chamber of Commerce in Oklahoma City was. 
they had been waiting around for a revival of the oil prices and they decided wait no longer we can't fall off the floor we have to do something so a group of us started designing a new strategy and we started applying these models of uh, of networks and trying to figure out how can we engage, how can we link, how can we leverage these assets that we have in Oklahoma City. Well this is Oklahoma City today. It's a vibrant downtown, it's a dynamic place. So my next stop on my tour is in Charleston, South Carolina. Uh, around 2000, Ernest Andrade came up to me. Ernest is an employee of the city. Uh, he had an idea and he had a logo. Uh, his logo was the Charleston Digital Corridor. He wanted to create an environment in Charleston that supported entrepreneurs and high growth companies, but he didn't know how to do that. So we sat down at breakfast after breakfast every month or so and ch charted out a strategy. And we decided that the best way to do this was to look at how do we build brain power with 21st century skills? How do we convert that brain power into wealth through innovation and entrepreneurship networks? How do we create that quality connected place that makes this place sticky? Because of both smart people and uh, innovative companies, they won't stay in a dump, they'll leave. So we have to have a quality connected place. We also started to talk about how do we change the narrative of Charleston? We can't change the narrative if we keep talking about Charleston as just a tourist destination. We've got to change the narrative around it's an innovation hotspot. And then lastly, we looked at how do we build collaboration, not just once, not an event, but ongoing. So if you look now, in 2011, Charleston and Oklahoma City sit behind Austin as the hotspots for, for new business growth. The point of this is that we can transform communities. We know how to do this. We can build communities and we can build regional economic growth. In fact, some folks are looking at Oklahoma City and saying, Wow, this is a model that could be replicated, indeed. So my next stop actually was in West Lafayette at the Purdue Center for Regional Development because I wanted to then take the lessons of what we were learning over the last 15 years or so and distill them and to teach these lessons and these disciplines. And so at Purdue, what we're working on is building out this new regional discipline, this discipline of economic growth. How do we do that? Well, what we've learned is that we can boil it down to these three things. One, we need to think differently. Two, we need to behave differently. And three, we need to do differently. So what does thinking differently mean? Well, we've got to uh, first frame this issue outside of the ideological context that our, our Democratic and Republican uh, parties have given us. They're, looking in the they're driving into the future looking in the rearview mirror. And what we've got to do is come up with an approach that moves or transcends this ideological locks, uh, uh, controversy that we've, we've locked ourselves into. Why? Because ideolo ideology kills innovation. So what we've come up with is this whole notion that our world is really defined, our economy is really defined first by a civic economy. These are activities and, and uh, investments that are publicly valuable but not privately profitable. Our first civic entrepreneur in this country was Benjamin Franklin. Uh, he created the insurance company, he created a uh, library, he created the, the essence or the seed of the University of Pennsylvania. He was a civic entrepreneur and nested inside our, our civic economy is our market economy. This is the engine of wealth creation. And so our challenge becomes how do we make these two things work together? work together much more effectively and efficiently and productively. Part of the challenge can be seen this way. We have a, an old economy, our grandfather's economy, we use that technical term, our grandparents' economy, how we built wealth in the past through hierarchies. And that started in the 1870s, as, as I said, in the uh, early uh, 1980s, I started to see a new economy emerging. And that new economy is a, an economy built on networks. It's built on how we collaborate across organizational and political boundaries. And we're stuck in the middle here. We've got this real challenge now, and we can start to see this challenge quite clearly by thinking about how do we get the assets from our grandparents' economy and start to migrate them to the networks, the new networks of our grandchildren's economy, 
because when we do that, we will start to move our economies to a new level. That's what happened in Oklahoma City. That's what's happened in Charleston. So behaving differently, what does that mean? Well, in our economy, in our American economy, civility matters. And it's civility matters because it stands at the core of innovation. Without civility, we cannot innovate. So I take you back to May 1787, John Madison's notes and the founders as they convened in Philadelphia. The first thing that the founders did was pass rules of civility. The reason they needed to do that was because they were coming together and they knew they were going to be dealing with hot button issues, really tough questions. And without those rules of civility, they could not do the complex thinking together. So rules of civility in our American democracy are not nice to have. They stand at the core of our ability to build that civic economy. So what do we mean by doing differently? By doing differently, we mean we got to think and do strategically differently than what we were learned, what we were taught. In the past, we were taught strategic planning. That's how you get a whole group of people moving toward a strategic outcome is strategic planning. Well, that works in a hierarchical organization where there's a command and control, but it doesn't work in our communities where nobody can tell anybody what to do. So we're designing and have designed strategic doing, which is an agile strategy discipline where we learn and we do and we learn and we do. We make adjustments along the way. It's a continuous process. It's more like open source software development. Strategic action plans are short and they're very focused and they come out in version 1.1 and 1.2 and 1.3. Say goodbye to the 300 page strategic plan. It doesn't work. When we do strategic doing and when we teach people how to do strategic doing, this is what happens. The conflict starts to move toward alignment. People start to see opportunities as they link and leverage their resources. Those opportunities are defined by those linkages and the great, great things happen. So let me give you a few examples. We tried these approaches in our own region with a $15 million grant from the federal government. We got 88% of the money, 8% of the money that was awarded in that grant process nationally. After four years, we produced 40% of the results. How did we do this? We looked for ideas and collaborations that were uh, scalable, replicable, and sustainable. We wanted to create value, and we did. We had over 60 different initiatives. 80% of them continued on past the initial funding. The most amazing part of this process, however, is we hired one and a half people to manage this. Why? Because everybody was working together. We had a common language. We had a common set of understandings. We had built trust over time. So we created something like the Purdue Guitar Summer Camp. Uh, Mark French, a, a professor at uh, Purdue, came to us with an idea. I think I can teach young kids how to uh, understand manufacturing today by teaching them how to make a guitar, an electric guitar. We said, Mark, that's great. 220 kids, that's great. How do you do 200? How do you do 2,000? He came back with the answer, and today, this past summer, over 20 different sites across the country have the Purdue Guitar Summer Camp going. Uh, second, the green collar manufacturing. Picture the scene. We're in the White County Courthouse, in the basement, a very small courthouse, eight people sitting around the table wondering what could we do to put ourselves on the map in renewable energy. Somebody came up with the idea, green collar manufacturing. We don't have a certification in that. We don't have the skills yet certified for zero landfill manufacturing. Could we do that? Fast forward two years, we not only did that, it's now in eight states. So our colleagues up at the University of Wisconsin have also used these approaches, these models and to build their water cluster. It's a remarkable story. This map was drawn four months after they did a strategic doing workshop. It shows all of the different assets that they started to connect together. And in the middle, it shows that they identified strategic areas where they could collaborate, where they could jointly create value and create this opportunity. Now we have Flint. Flint is a, a very sad case and part of the challenge. But you know, our colleagues in Michigan State are starting to move Flint forward with what? Neighborhoods without borders. Trying to figure out how do we regenerate neighborhoods 
with the networks and the assets we have access to. So the answer to our transformation doesn't come from Washington. It comes from rooms like this. Each one of us has 30, 40, 50 different colleagues. Imagine a room 30, 40, 50 times the size and tell me we can't transform something. So in this, I go back to the map that I had because it's critically important to understand that most of the concentration of our work has actually been in what we call the Great Lakes Nation. And it is right that this should be too, uh, true because our Great Lakes Nation was really formed out of the Northwest Ordinance of 1787. And Thomas Jefferson drafted that ordinance to cure the infirmities of what he saw with the 13 original colonies. He gave this whole region a new lease on life. He said, look, we need religious freedom, we need a commitment to education, we don't need slavery. So in the, that ordinance, where they, he saw the perfection of American democracy happening, he outlined those critical dimensions of our innovation, of our opportunity to innovate. And in fact, that's, in, that's exactly what's happened. So now in Rockford and in Flint and in uh, Terre Haute and in uh, Kokomo, all over, the, all over the Great Lakes Nation, these things are happening, Grand Rapids. So I leave you with this. It's a quote from a son of a founder, John Quincy Adams. It says, if your actions inspire others to dream more, to learn more, to do more, to become more, then you are a leader. So with that, let's get moving. Thank you.